uh, welcome everyone. <clears throat> um, it's really wonderful to be here. Um, right, so I know that cyber psychology is a new topic um, and I'll tell you how new it is. <laughs> um, so what actually is cyber psychology? It is an interdisciplinary field. What does that mean? It means that every, so it has a number of professionals that contribute to it, okay? So for example, um, <clears throat> computer scientists, um, neurologists, uh, data scientists, all of these contribute to cyber psychology. But it really, as a subject, focuses on the psychological phenomena that happen as a result of interacting with digital technology. Um, and another way of actually explaining cyber psychology is that it really looks at how technology impacts how we think about things and our behavior, okay? So that's what cyber psychology is in a nutshell. And hopefully throughout these, uh, throughout the session, I will walk you through, I will help you understand what cyber psychology is um, a little better. But I should say that cyber psychology got its backbone from the rise of internet use uh, by um, lay persons. Uh, or in commercial use in the 1990s, which means that research actually in, in cyber psychology started in the early 2000s, okay? So that's how new it is. And that's probably why um, some of you have not heard of it, um, but that's that's cyber psychology. Um, but what it hopes to do, what, it, what uh, researchers tend to do in cyber psychology are three key things, okay? So they look at already, existing psychological theory and try to apply it online to understand online behavior, okay? And I'll give you some examples of those theories in a minute. Um, another thing that it hopes to do, um, well, hopes to do is, is explore and what it does is it, it explores how tech, we can use technology to enhance human performance. Um, and that human in, uh, p performance, enhancing human performance, what that really um, means old with the new is that, um, you know, it, it uses a lot of, um, well, the military tend to use this type of concept um, in the early 70s of enhancing human performance, but slowly integrating technology into this idea that, you know, technology can improve humans' cognition, their, the way they think, uh, their physical, physical uh, nature, okay? Um, and... Another thing, this is some design, so design in terms of designing websites, okay, and applications and, and software, but um, a, a nice little area that's tucked in under the branch of cyber psychology is something called either human factors, so it looks into human factors or um, UX design or usability, there's so many, or usability engineering, there's so many ways of describing this, this little, this area, um, but ultimately it applies cognitive psycholog psychology theory from 80s, 70s, 80s and even 90s to improve the usability of these uh, websites and applications. But for example, um, you see your screen, actually you're looking at it now, um, and say you want to you want to delete a document. Um, and you would take that document and you'd say either I can't send to bin or send to trash, okay? And then if you go to your trash can or recycling bin on your desktop, you will see that it looks like a trash can that you have in your office. So that was the idea, is that it, it wanted to replicate and create icons that are very usable for you as a user. So that's what that area looks at. Um, but hopefully you understand what that means um, because there's a whole, there's a, like I say, it's a nice little area embedded through. Um, but I'll, I'll walk you through some examples in a minute. So first, okay, so like I said, there's many different parts to cyber psychology. Uh, the first one that I'm going to walk you through is really psychology based, okay, um, as in primarily uh, using social psychology um, and the understanding of who you are, okay. So the title of this is The Self in Cyberspace. So there's two, so what that means is how you identify with yourself and how you portray yourself online, okay? So how, if, if, um, if you portray yourself online, 
in a way that's really close to who you are, then there tends to be um, there ten you tend to be a happy person and you tend to be uh, quite. So this is what the theory says, right? You tend to be a happy person, happy with who you are. Um, but if there's a, a big discrepancy between how you portray yourself online and who you actually are, there, there tends to be in the literature, at least, of course, you know, we can't generalize it to everyone. Um, and I'll explain that in a minute. But um, if you portray yourself online, that's very far from who you actually are. There tends to be a lot of, uh, you know, self-esteem issues and, you know, things like that. We hear about it all the time of uh, people who are Instagram and they portray a different um, person to who they are. Um, and this is really, you know, looking at social media um, and chat rooms and things like that. Um, and the reason why we say, I say you can't generalize it to everyone is because um, some people, for example, play like to play games, not play games with others online, but as in gaming. OK, um, and they tend to create characters of who they want to be. OK, so that they can uh, kind of feed into a fantasy that they have. Um, and this is not to say that there's self-esteem issues, but it's just feeding into a fantasy. I mean, for example, you can't be um, you can't be. Uh, oh, my gosh, you can't be a unicorn in the real world, but you can be a unicorn while you're gaming. Right. You can select that as a character and you can live and breathe it. Right. So when I talk about yourself online, I'm talking about a persona. How do you portray yourself online? So moving forward, if I talk about personas, that's what I mean. Um, now, um, two main theories. I mean, like it, it's a very new topic, right? So there's much. There's going to be much more theories coming in and try attempting to apply it online. But there's two theories that really look uh, that really have made its way into cyberspace. Or, um, looking at how we conduct ourselves online. Uh, the first one is equalization hypothesis. Um, and this hypothesis hypothesizes that when you remove social cues online but through anonymity, right, because you, you go online, people are not looking at you as you would with face to face. Um, and because there's that removal of social cues, um, there's also the reduction of associated stereotypes so for example you're not a you're not a woman online you are not um you are not black you're not pink you're not gray you're not brown you're not those colors you're, there's no race online okay um there's no race online so you can kind of be more not powerful but you can be more confident online um but on the flip side when this is the problem right so but on the flip side, when you do go online and there's just some indication of, you know, I'm a woman or um, I'm I'm black or I'm, you know, whatever. If there is just some indication that tends to be magnified and uh, the kind of stigma associated with it, if there is any, um, tends to be highlighted by fellow users. Um, so that's where it can cause harm, but mostly it's good because the social cues are removed. And, and with research, in research, we tend to um, look at both sides, right? So you can't just kind of look down one avenue, you have to look at both. And what they did find was that there is kind of uh, that component and that if you know if you say girl underscore three six five then they're gonna be like oh she's a girl she can't play a game she can't play games what is she doing here you know that kind of mentality and i give you that as an example because that is actually found in the literature um now uh i i i personally love that this topic has come up in online cyberspace because this is, um, I say it's infamous, it is infamous, it's an infamous study that was conducted in 1973 that proposed an idea of de-individuation. The idea, it's a theory, but it's an idea that when a person is um, <clears throat> given a persona or given an, uh, something to a role play, they will really, really uh, take on that that role. And um, for ex so the study, what the study was uh, aimed to do was to look at <clears throat> uh, so it's a social experiment in 1973 at Stanford University and uh, a researcher Philip Zimbardo, he uh, wanted to create a prison uh, simulation where he recruited participants and participants were randomly assigned to either a prisoner or a guard. And um, the prison, the experiment was supposed, just really quickly, right? The prison was, the experiment was supposed to last a really long time, <clears throat> but it only lasted two weeks uh, because the guards were, had adopted the, pers pers the persona, um, 
or the identification as a god, a prison god, and became very brutal towards prisoners. Um, and the same on the other hand, on the other side, is that prisoners really adopted that personality of a prisoner. So they went on hunger strikes, um, they, they misbehaved, um, and they truly believed they couldn't get out of the prison. Um, so, so of course that had to stop for ethical reasons, but this theory uh, can really ap apply to online um, in that, you know, if, if you identify with a group, so for example, uh, let's say girl underscore 365, let's say for, I don't know why that's numbers come to me, but it's an example. Um, girl underscore 365 joins a male, um, uh, joins a, a female uh, group like chat room and 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 it is now their group and they meet every week or whatever the case may be um and they sometimes they talk about a uh, woman um <clears throat> so woman empowerment and things like that feminism okay let's say and then they're not exclusively femi feminism group but they're just in a group together and sometimes they talk about men or you know the empowerment of women but then mistakenly because it is an open group this is an example right uh, a male, an indicated male comes in, um, the woman will, the woman in that group will really adopt who they are and really attack that male, okay? Um, so that's the idea of the individuation online, is that whichever group they're in, um, people really identify with that name of that group. This is why labeling of chat rooms or whatever the case may be, or even names groups on Facebook, you know, you get those pages, that's really important because it will really define how people behave within that um, within that group or that page or whatever you call it, right? Um, and I've put this lovely little picture here uh, so that you can see, uh, the, uh, so Philip Zimbardo, if you want to read it, <clears throat> I know this is social psychology, um, but, you know, there's a book that he wrote is the Lucifer effect and every kind of idea that came out of his study. Um, I have the book and I think you should read it. Um, yeah, so that is uh, the self in cyberspace. Now, another part of cyber psychology, I mean, there it's endless, right? There's loads of uh, different areas within psychology, but I'm picking the ones that are interesting. Um, but yeah, so forensic cyber psychology, it basically, it is forensic psychology. So the study of, it's uh, the study of um, crime, right? Um, and the psychology of crime. It's the study of the psychology of crime committers or victims, okay? Um, well, it, yeah, but, um, but when it comes to uh, cyber psychology, so, so forensic cyber psychology, it's exactly forensic psychology just when a crime is committed using a computer or a network, okay? So when I say a network, what I mean is, um, you know, for example, uh, cyber terrorism, hacking, malware development and distribution, okay? Because um, imagine developing it and not actually distributing it, it's not really a crime. <laughs> um, and then there's the uh, online sexual predators. So for example, um, there is a, there is a, so with cyber stalking, there is, uh, there are several steps that, that lead to the pro progression of actual attack, okay? Um, and that really is exactly mirrored online. Um, so it's exactly the same as, um, it, it's not exactly the same, but it's really interesting to see that how people react innately as a, as a stalker that is then moved on to online and it's the exact same steps. It's, this is why you need to be a psychologist to understand cyber psychology because you need to know these theories and if and if, especially if they apply online and if not, you create a new theory, right? That's the idea. So with regards to forensic cyber psychology, the, there's a few, th a few um, topics that have been adopted from psychology and one of them is the rational choice theory. So this theory explains a decision of committing crime given the possibilities of reward or punishment. <clears throat> okay, so um, if, you know, let's say commit murder, for example, that's extreme. Again, um, if you commit murder, the punishment is life, um, life imprisonment depends, like secondary degree, different, right? So there's different murder uh, sentencing. Um, <clears throat> so, and then of course, if you just steal something from the shop, they're very different. <laughs> so it depends, you know, that's the rationale behind the choice of committing a crime. That's one theory. Of course, it doesn't apply to everything, right? Because, well, why, why should it? Um, 
because there's the other uh, reason why people commit crimes is that they have cognitive distortions. It's just a really skewed way of thinking. Um, so people think might think that something is okay. So if you it's the rationale in your head that <clears throat> I don't have food to feed my family, so it's okay to steal because I need to. Okay, that's our evolution coming in, um, coming into play to fend for our families. Um, but overall, cybercrime is fast paced and, and it's constantly going on, especially, um, well, especially because people are in their own worlds. Um, but there's much more research that needs to um, needs to be done in this area as in because, of course, it was only done. To, this this area was only uh, kind of evolved in uh, 21 years ago. So, you know, it's not even hard in the uh, police radar to actually investigate this type of stuff online. And it's not really a crime. Cyber stalking is not a crime in some countries. Uh, so more research. If some of you are interested, do it. <laughs> um, but of course, there are issues with this research, which is also another reason why there's not many uh, theories being placed online is because identification of these criminals are hard. It is very hard because of the anonymity of being online. So, you know, being online has good good uh, pros and cons, right? Now, e-therapy. E-therapy is actually um, just therapy taking place online, okay? So that could be either asynchronous or synchronous in terms of um, asynchronous being offline. So you could email a therapist just telling them your feelings um, and you could do that as well, text message, or whatever the case is, it's written, okay? That's the idea. Um, but then you also get synchronous, which is online. Uh, so a video call or phone call, okay? But the, with everything, anything, there's pros and cons. So the pro is that, you know, clients tend to be more honest and cooperative because they don't see your face. So, or, you know, they're just more on, honest and open. And uh, you can really, the therapist and the client can really go into deeper topics um, in a shorter time. Um, you know, people don't have to travel to uh, the place of therapy as well, which, you know, sometimes, you know, they can be late or whatever. There's just a lot of confounding factors. Um, and of course, if it's text-based or asynchronous, you really, you get a, a, tech, a written version. So you can always go back to what the therapist has said. But of course, with anything, there is negatives, okay? So you will uh, clients will run the risk of uh, finding deceptive e-therapies online. There's a risk to confidentiality being hacked, of being hacked, right? There's also, and this is my, this is one of the big reasons, is that there's a lack of nonverbal cues, okay? This can lead to serious misunderstanding from both clients and the, and the therapist side. <clears throat> um, and that, and that, you know, I mean, if someone's sad, so I mean, you can hear it in their tone of voice, but still, it's not the same. And half the time, client uh, therapists are not really trained at that level to actually pick up the tone of voice if it's phone call or whatever the case may be. Um, but yeah, and then obviously internet connection, which I hope some of you are not having today. Issues. <laughs> okay, and then now addiction. So this is the other part of cyber psychology is that people can get addicted to being online or looking up content, content online. So um, the idea is that persistent use of the internet can actually lead to being ad ad addicted, okay? And this also goes for online gaming as well. Um, and actually just persistent use of internet or um, in um, internet addiction has actually made its way into the diagnostic statistical manual uh, for, you know, for diagnosing uh, mental health issues. So this is something to be aware of. Um, and, and key signs, I mean, uh, for example, I'm addicted to my phone, I know it. And we shouldn't really throw this, this, this uh, term of addiction really loosely, but I can tell you, um, is that, for example, we all think that we're addicted, right? But, you know, the key thing, signs to look out for is that you're constant, if you're not by your phone or you're not online, you're constantly thinking about it. You're constantly thinking of questions and then, oh, let me Google the answer. Um, and if you don't, then it really induces some serious anxiety if you're not doing that, okay? So that's what the drug addict's brain is. Um, but so we can, so addiction ad applies across um 
addiction models of addiction can app are applied to a multitude of things okay even though okay so it can be applied to you know exercise people get addicted to exercise sex gambling gaming they get addicted to relationships of course shopaholics um, and then internet usage and this was conducted in uh, this research was conducted in 1997 so it just shows you how early that is when it's applied to online but um, when it comes to I mean addiction is, a, is an old classical thing within psychology because of substance abuse okay um, um, substance abuse uh, well and if people don't actually get for example um, the, the substance that they seek um, so their choice of drug or uh, exercise or any one of these key points they tend to um, they tend to have withdrawal symptoms so shaking well it depends it depends so shaking um, shaking anxieties things like that um, now you could argue with me, but isn't that the substance? Um, isn't that the substance inducing it? But there's two things to addiction. The first one is the substance, okay? Uh, so cocaine, methamphetamine, oh, similar. Um, just any type of drug that can be used and that causes an addiction. But then if you look at uh, exercise, sex, gambling, those are don't have a, um, a, a kind of drug component to them. They are behaviors, right? But these really develop as as a as a result of reward. Okay, so exercise, endorphins are released um, when you know when you're done exercising. Endorphins are released, so you feel really happy. Um, I'm not going to go into sex, you know. Uh, gambling, uh, same is that you know if you win, you get endorphins released and you get really happy. Uh, gaming, you're winning, it's great. And then when you don't win, it's very frustrating. So it's got to do with this reward system, right? And that's the classical model of addiction. Um, and the same idea is applied to online usage, okay? So it's online, you search or question, and it's gotta be immediate and fast, okay? So perhaps someone that's also addic that's addicted to online, uh, whatever, gaming content, just being online, uh, if they're not online, may just look at their behavior when they have no internet access it, or there's a slow, um, slow internet connection. It really, really, you see uh, the behaviors. I'm sure you've seen some of those videos out there where a kid is uh, really angry at their mom for taking away a PS3 or a PS4 now, but PS3 because they're old videos. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's that's the classical models of addiction. Um, so I've just talked a little bit about uh, gaming addiction, online gaming addiction, or uh, actually they're the same for internet addiction as well. Uh, so in 2006, um, researchers conducted um, research with 10 Taiwanese uh, teenage gamers that were considered to be addicted to gaming or just being online. And, uh, and they found ultimately that there's four main reasons why uh, people get addicted to playing games or um, being online is that they use, of course, entertainment and leisure, of course, but they use it as a coping mechanism, emotional coping mechanism, because the world out there is just too hard um, for them or there's something going on in their life is what I mean, that they are not able to kind of connect. Uh, they just want to escape, okay, just an escape. Um, and then it's excitement and challenge seeking. So that's what really, as we spoke about last slide, is that that's the reward and pun the reward side that, you know, excitement. So that's what gets really addictive. And then, like I say, escape, escaping from reality, okay? Okay, so now we're moving to uh, technology, psychology and technology. So this was that little component that I mentioned about human performance, um, human increasing human performance um, and using technology to help with um, thought processes and things like that. Um, yeah, okay. So, um, right. So first part of the psychology and technology is human computer interaction. Now, this is probably something some of you have actually heard of. Um, it is a computer science. It's it's tucked within computer science. Um, but for example, uh, it's tucked within computer science, but it is actually has it has a psychological component. So, for example, HCI researchers will often collaborate with psychologists um, in research uh, because they're closely, closely, closely related. Um, but they don't 
but you know, of course, the psychologists know more of psychology and the HCI know more of the uh, online environment or not online, sorry, the technological environment. Um, so HCI uh, is the study and design of testing interactive computer systems. Um, and the goal of HCI is to create interactive computer mediated experiences which are effective, efficient and useful for the user. OK, so it's just basically making you, your life easier when you're going on when you go online. OK, um, so ultimately what researchers aim to do is to develop better interaction paradigms, models and theories. So, you know, something like, for example, a HCI researcher um, will create so there's multimodal ways of interacting with your screen. So for example, uh, Xbox, we, oh, not we, uh, where you interact with a kind of module. So there's different ways of interacting. You can um, move the stick and you'll see the interaction online um, on the screen. Um, of course, there's the mouse, um, but then there's some mouse where you are moving your mouse around and um, you can enable every time you click for it to vibrate um, and if it, you don't click or whatever there's no vibration so it's just an in, so that's what human computer interactions interaction researchers do they look at how whether these in, integration of these type of vibrations heat sometimes heat pads you know for your hands or whatever the case may be they look at how whether that enhances your interaction with online or whether it uh, impedes it and if it impedes it of course they're not going to kind of they well they can still publish it and say hey guys to the rest of the world designing like Google or Microsoft or whatever the case may be um, hey guys don't use this our research said that if you have a heat pad under the mouse uh, participants don't like it or users don't like it so that's what HCI does um, I've spoken a little bit about this um, so that yeah they look at the capability so right I've just spoken about it, but ultimately um, HCI projects look at the design and implement implementation and testing of an interface or a mobile app for an online social network. Um, there's three things to consider. So the user, is it comfortable? Are they capable of doing their uh, tasks that they intended to do? And what are the limitations? Um, and then the other uh, factor is the computer. Will this computer, what computer system will the user be interacting with? Um, you know, what type of devices will be will they be using? And what constraints does it impose? So that's exactly what I've just said, but a little bit more well described. Um, and then the task is that um, what does the need, user need from the system? Okay, right. So that's HCI project. Um, and embedded again, so I mentioned about, well, embedded within HCI, it's all a lovely little branch for you guys to remember, right? Um, but HCI has an area called, well, human factors or usability, um, is usability engineering design, but ultimately, um, it's designing for people. Okay, so thinking about how people, it's making people's lives better every day. Um, and uh, helping them to make decisions, planning a meal, painting, writing, composing things. Okay, and this is all what human factors is. Um, and of course, a big part of designing for people to really I'd like to think of it as extreme empathy because, you know, if designing something for someone, for example, driving, if you're a HCI researcher and you don't drive, um, can you connect with drivers? Hmm. If you want to look at driving and you can't connect with driving because you actually don't drive. Um, but that's the idea is that you have extreme empathy because you think about what people do on a daily basis to make it easier. Um, so that's that's what uh, human factors is. So, for example, uh, ergonomics when you're in a computer. So if you look behind me, my chair is quite long, quite high. That really helps with my posture. HCI researchers help to design that or the 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 structure. The, the, the structure of my mouse. Anyway, I'm going in circle. But in order to, for example, design a a really good uh, interface, for example, there's a key factor that that is um, important here, and that is the role of memory. Okay. So, for example, if you're on the home page of, let's say, Facebook, for example, if you're on the home page of Facebook, you will. Um, 
you will need to and you want to look for a friend that you haven't seen forever you go and you click friends and then your know, list of friends come up so the idea is that things are meant to be intuitive um, so for example if a person is selling clothes online um, one I don't know if you have it where you are but for example ASOS clothing um, clothing online clothing shop uh, they designed their their products and you can kind of move toward uh, between pants or oh, trousers sorry pants whatever um, blouses whatever the case may be through different cloth clothing lines and then um, for example I had a, um, a colleague that was designing a website for selling wine okay and because she used the clothing ASOS line quite often she decided to follow that um, follow that outline um, because it was intuitive. Um, so that that's the idea intuitive. So it's easy to use. But there is like I said, there's a big part of memory that 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 happens here is that there's three stores, three memory stores when it comes to interacting with something It's the sensory store. This is why researchers look at vibration or heat, because these these type of multiple sensory inputs, how people remember things. Okay, so if you're uh, your mother cooked something ages ago or when you were a child and um, and now someone's cooking something and it, you know it triggers a memory right so a sensory store but it, it would be nice to have it integrated into a computer experience um, and then you get short-term or work, working memory so this is not something that is then put into long-term memory um, it is uh, something that is immediate so for example if you're reading a paragraph you remember the content of the beginning of the paragraph because of this memory working memory right and then you get long-term memory so both short-term memory sensory memory so sensory memory so vibrations on the keyboard or the mouse for example um, may helps you pay attention and um and then you're you know you're interacting with the system and it, and then that your working memory comes into um, effect and through sensory and um, through sensory memory as well as short-term and working memory constant um, interaction there's the rehearsal component so it's it's um, you know there's the constant haptic feedback constant reading constantly moving from one page to another and, and understanding the website um, that then gets stored in your long-term memory okay so that's that's my walkthrough of memory uh, use for users um, when interacting with a website. I hope that was clear. <laughs> it's really hard if I don't have a website open for you, for examples. But okay, so I mean, if you have any questions, uh, just make sure that you ask me at the end. Okay. So now another part of computing is affective computing, but affective means emotion. So if emotional computing, um, and what affective computing aims to do uh, well it is the study of um how all different devices systems so devices as in robots systems so avatars can recognize process interpret and simulate human emotions okay so the interaction between a human and a robot that designing the robot to enable an effective interaction with a human so that's what effective computing is okay um it's it is immediately related to emotion okay emotion theory um and it's multidisciplinary as with all of this is uh it's multidisciplinary so it includes computer scientists psychologists and cognitive science um so that's what effective computing is but um just a little bit more um in depth here um effective computing and social interactions basically in order to help simulate um, a, a human interaction with you know an, a robot or an avatar an online avatar or agent um, you need to simulate you need to capture human to human interaction and then simulate that in the human <clears throat> and robot or agent interaction and what what the area within effective computing this is called it's called social signals processing so social signals processing captures human to human um interactions through a lot of technologies that are able to capture this interaction and then simulates it and designs avatars based on that interaction 
Um, so that's that's the two. So it's effective computing and then the social signals processing domain, which is within effective computing. And it is um, it is the basis of understanding human interactions. OK, and that's obviously uh, primarily based on, so, on psychology. Um, psychological literature and the theory of emotion again you see how all of these really take on old psychological literature so theory of emotion this theory of emotion started back in the day with Charles Darwin okay where Charles Darwin is an evolutionary biologist and he said that um, there are emotions uh, facial expressions that people display that can be recognized across or that, that can be recognized okay so that's all he said and then in 1960s and 1970s uh, a, a researcher by the name of Ekman actually further studied it and found that there are six well five or six depending on which approach you're taking uh, five or six core emotions that really um that can be recognized across the globe universally okay because what he did was he looked at um, he's an anthropologist so he went into some tri to tribes in Amazon and some tri tribes in Africa sorry and he showed them these faces and they all described happiness as happiness sadness as sadness and the, the one with the most accuracy was anger and it's just really interesting how this really ties into evolution and how you know anger is is survival right so if you see someone's angry you'll avoid them right so evolution um but of course with any theory there's been a lot of criticism with that theory um and other people have come up with lovely different theories to say that you know it's not it's not universally uh, recognized. There are cultural differences. Um, there are there's just so many differences that it's not the same across for the whole world <laughs> to recognize, right? Um, so yeah, there's if I had to go, we could have a whole session on the different emotion theories of emotion. But the key one that you need to know is that there's the basic emotion theory where there's five or six emotions that people think uh, that these researchers think are able to um, people are able to recognize universally. Um, now, in order to uh, recognize a human humans emotions, you need to look at their nonverbal signals okay so you know how they sit um how they sit are they interested for example the first woman there with her on, on this picture um she doesn't look interested okay she doesn't want to be there this is the interpretation just looking at her and we've evolved to look at her like this not not look at her like this or interpret that but it's just we've evolved to naturally and really fast interpret attitude and emotion through all these different communication channels which include gestures postures body movements of course this is a static picture so we can't see them moving um, and they're not speaking of course but i can tell just by her um non-verbal uh, the way she's sitting is that she doesn't want to be there and the second woman i think she's quite sad um or she's there for a reason oh this could be uh, a projection but she's happy to be there um oh not happy to be there she's very sad something's going on in her life um, and then the third woman she's thinking about something on the paper and so is the um the, the fourth person and then the fifth person is struggling <laughs> so yeah so that's basically i mean it could not it doesn't mean that exactly but this is all from the non-verbals that i can read there um but yes there are different channels of communication and uh social signal researchers call this different modalities um, and of course you get facial expression postures and I've mentioned that and this is how, so in in order to develop effective uh, agents that are able to interact with a human you know um, they like I said you need to capture human to human interaction and then inform the development of the avatar right so in order to do that you need um, these researchers have technology that's able to capture facial expression I'm sure you've heard it's all over the news everywhere actually so you capture facial expression you can actually capture gestures postures body movements and this is what is being captured in this human to human interaction which is lovely. Um, so I've just mentioned about social signals processing, but this really provides, a, the last one, really provides a great into, uh, description. Um, 
Modelings of social interaction can potentially be used to train an unsocial machine to interact with humans using appropriate nonverbal cues to ensure the interaction is more natural and as a result trusted by users, which means that they'll come back and use the agent again. Of course, if you're trying to sell something, then that's that's great because people are going to buy your product. OK, now um, I just want to give you a little uh, view on a, a technology, a technology that's able to capture emotion in the voice. Um, so let me just give you some background. This this software is called Nemesisco, and it is um, it claims to detect emotion from the voice, um, and that's one channel of communication, right? So if you can see here, this is the technology here, and it's presented in a um, in a diamond shape. So here you can't really see it now until the video is played, but it's confident, emotional. There's energetic. There's passionate. Um, so the, these really are the emotions that are captured when a person's speaking. So for example, if I was talking to you now and I had the technology on, it would, I don't know what it would read, probably energetic or confident or um, happy to be here, basically. Um, that's what the technology, um, but I wanted to show you specifically in two people, Winston Churchill, uh, because Winston Churchill was, um, is a very confident speaker. He really knows what he's talking about. And he adopted the love of a, of a whole nation because of the way in which he communicated um, and did, did his, uh, uh, his speeches. Okay, they really charmed the world. Okay, so oh, the nation uh, of the UK. So I'm going to press play. Um, so hopefully you can the, the idea, right? So the idea was that it was confident. So let's let's have a little play here. Let us therefore brace ourselves to our duty. So bear ourselves that if the British Empire and its Commonwealth last for a thousand years, men will still say this. So as you can see, there's a, the, oh, there's, yeah, so this is a little summary. So mostly he was excited. Um, mostly he was, uh, let's just close that. So confident and excited and energetic. Uh, so this is the absolute summary um, of how Winston Churchill portrayed himself emotion and the thing is these emotions are unconscious okay and this is what the technology supposedly picks up and now another another key speaker in history or well, not key speaker but key speaker for the reason i'm about to tell you so he was a very king george was a i can't remember the number that he was they'll crucify me for that but uh king george was um a really nervous speaker and he had a, a stammer or a stutter and um whenever he was due to give a speech, he had a script and he read it many, many times before he actually got to give a speech, um, give the speech or press on the radio live, you're now live. So he, you know, he was very nervous. Let's have a look at, um, at the, the outcomes, the emotional outcomes detected by this technology. In our history, I send to every household of my people, both at home and overseas, this message. So you can see there's some confidence, there's a lot of mental effort, and he was quite stressed. Uh, so that just shows you the capabilities of some softwares out there that are able to detect emotion in the voice. Um, now this also, I mean, we're almost finished, but this really, um, so that technology then helps to develop intelligent tutors, okay? So for example, in therapy session or a support session. So 
uh, t one technology that's been developed is, or agent that's been developed is called Multisense, or it's a project, and it's design, designed to help interpret nonverbal behaviors to infer psychological stress. And so this, now we've passed the social signals processing domain, which I've just shown you some technologies that's able to do that. Now, once that's captured, defined, and then developed, this is what it looks like right here. So this is the applied version of what we've just been talking about. So just briefly, oh, this is going to be really loud. Hi, I'm Ellie. Thanks for coming in today. I was created to talk to people in a safe and secure environment. I'm not a therapist, but I'm here to learn about people and would love to learn about you. I'll ask a few questions to get us started. And please feel free to tell me anything. Your answers are totally confidential. Are you okay with this? Yes. So, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. That's good. Where are you from originally? I'm from Los Angeles. Oh, I'm from LA myself. When was the last time you felt really happy? Uh, when was the last time? Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's three minutes. Um, I don't think, I mean, I want to, you get the gist of what this video is showing and I want to get to your questions. Um, so as you can see, uh, this is, I mean, it doesn't look that way, but this is just the model. Um, the face is just the model the that you see the codes on the eyes um, and this is really what sim the simsay therapist or supports worker is is uh, is looking at and has been programmed to not look at but programmed to detect okay um, and you can see the gaze attention and body activity here and and a whole a whole um, as well it's captured down here as well uh, so that's that's the that's the end result of what I've just been talking about with social signals processing and and emotion sorry emotions um, and uh, emotion detection and yeah human to human simulation so this is the end result so thank you for your attention but let me just conclude and summarize. Um, what I've been saying. So uh, psychology, cyber psychology is a really new area in psychology that hopes to understand the impact of technology on the human psyche and behavior. And there are many components to cyber psychology as you have come to find. Um, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Monica. I think we will just end the session here. Okay, thank yeah, you thank everyone. You so thank you guys. <laughs> Hi everyone, thank you for tuning into this webinar. We know for sure this skill will go a long way, so if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the comment section below. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe for more webinar replays. See you again, bye!